On this episode of On the Beat, we will speak to Chip Chesley and Jim Major from Concord General Services to remind you about safe driving this winter. On our Did You Know segment, we will revisit some of Concord's newer traffic patterns and winter driving safety tips. We will also talk to now retired Steve Sargent and Peter Thompson from the New Hampshire Highway Safety about motor vehicle safety. And we will talk again about Operation Hat Trick at Concord High School. This month's Did You Know segment will focus on traffic safety. Did you know that there is a new traffic pattern at the intersection of Eastside Drive and Loudoun Road? If you are traveling south on Eastside Drive, once you reach the intersection of Loudoun Road, the left lane at this intersection is for left turns only onto Loudoun Road. The right lane now allows traffic to make a left turn, right turn, or continue straight onto Canterbury Road. Vehicles in the left-hand lane must remain in their lane while turning onto Loudoun Road. There are several new rotaries that have been put in place in the city of Concord. When approaching a rotary from any direction, you must remember to yield to traffic that is currently inside the rotary. Please also watch for pedestrians crossing in the crosswalk. They may be crossing from the right side of your vehicle. And please use your directional to make your intention known to the other drivers which direction you intend to go. While traveling on Loudoun Road heading towards the downtown Concord area, please pay attention to the lane markings. Stay in your lane and only change lanes when it is safe to do so. Remember, you may only change lanes when there is a dotted line. If there is a solid line, you must remain in your own lane. Loudoun Road does become heavily congested in the area of Stickney Ave, especially during the morning and evening commutes. Please pay attention to this. If your light is green but the traffic in front of you is not moving, please be advised that it is against the law to block the intersection. There are several signs indicating this in this area. This can become especially hazardous if emergency vehicles are attempting to get through this location. With winter fast approaching, we're up here at Concord General Services we're speaking to the director, Chip Chesley. We're also going to be speaking to the Highway and Utilities Superintendent, Jim Major. So Chip, what are some of the ways the city is preparing for uh, winter operations? Well, actually we start working on winter operations as early as uh, Halloween and the, the work actually starts with our fleet maintenance folks. Uh, we have about 30 pieces of equipment that we uh, uh, put on the streets during a winter storm and we go through all the equipment to make sure it's ready to go. Uh, there are the, the, the plow itself to make sure that's operable. Many of the pieces of equipment have a wing a plow next mm -hmm. to it and uh, we calibrate all the spreaders so that they put the right amount of salt onto the streets. So that work begins in uh, earnest so that we're in good shape by October and last year you know we had that early storm and uh, for the most part everything worked pretty well but I mean the ground rule here is to be ready for snow as early as Halloween. Great. What do you think your biggest challenges are kind of preparing for the season? Uh, I think the season is I think it's uh, in an analogy, it's like getting ready for a, a new game every time uh, that you've played the game before. Uh, certain things can happen that uh, you may not have thought of happened, and it, it just takes maybe a, a few storms to get back into your rhythm mm -hmm. uh, and have people become familiar again with the roots and the, the nooks and crannies that they need to move around in the city. That's good. So, yeah. How about some uh, tips for our viewers of how, what they can do to uh, kind of help you guys out for winter operations? I think the biggest thing that could help us out, especially in a major storm or storm where school's been called, I mean, if you don't need to get out on the road, please don't. I mean, the, from your line of work, I think you will see most accidents occur when during the snowfall. Mm -hmm. And for the most part in, uh, throughout New Hampshire, uh, the next time, by the time the sun shines again, the roads are going to be pretty passable conditions. So if you can plan your trips accordingly and, and knock it out on the city streets, that's great. Uh, we oftentimes uh, get to the streets and then we move to the sidewalks and it may take us a day or so to get to the, all the sidewalks. So playing uh, with your children if they're walking to school, if there are ways that you can get them to school while we're working to get the sidewalks clear is good. Uh, and then the third part is at the very end of the storm, we're all tuckered out. We've got a number of hydrants throughout the city that we need to clear. And mm -hmm. if people want to help and clear those uh, hydrants before we get there, I think that would help the fire department and, and ourselves as well. So those three things. If you can wait, please wait. And uh, just think about using the sidewalks immediately after the snowstorm because we can't get to everything immediately. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is uh, between those snowstorms, if, if you really want to go out and do some exercise, feel free to help yourself with a hydrant. Mm -hmm. So Jim, how does your division prepare for the upcoming winter months? 
uh, as Chip had said, we'll start in the first part of October and work through the month basically trying to wrap up our uh, summer job, try to get everything cleaned up. And then towards the end of October, we'll have a safety meeting. And in that safety meeting, we'll go over a lot of the uh, logistical part of, uh, you know, when winter operations start, you know what I mean, how to prepare yourself as far as uh, eating well, getting enough rest and all that stuff because we've got some odd hours that happen. So that training will happen. We'll also talk about uh, plow routes, getting the folks familiar with their plow routes and uh, pieces of equipment that they'll be assigned and that type of stuff, and as well as sidewalk tractors, uh, getting them in, uh, involved and getting the routes out to them so that they can kind of see and maybe ride the route uh, and, and see what the hazards may be for them as they're plowing their routes uh, during the winter storm. So, Good. Uh, a lot of uh, people ask questions about, okay, there's a winter storm coming, it's forecast in the next couple of days. Yeah. What's the procedure? Uh, how we prepare, and we take a lot of different weather information. There's all kinds of information on the web. I'm sure everybody uh, looks at that. But we've also got a couple of other resources that where we can actually talk to some forecasters. Uh, there's two different forecasters that we talk to. And, and then we kind of start making our decisions on how we're going to uh, deploy the folks, okay? And, and how we run our operations is we, we'll run 24-7. Uh, uh, we're, we're here with some folks. But uh, our biggest effort comes from 11 at night until uh, 7 uh, the next morning and right through the day till 3 is where we have the heaviest amount of folks because there's not as many people on the road and we can get it more done. From 3 in the afternoon to 11 at night, uh, it's, it's tough to get around. Folks are getting home from work and that type of stuff. So, um, so that's what we do as far as getting ready for deploying and finding when we'll start and, and that type of stuff, setting up shifts and, and that type of thing. Um, a lot of people don't know, can you explain if, uh, what happens when there's a parking ban and how do citizens and residents get notified that there is one? Yeah. Uh, the city website is probably the best place because there's a banner that comes up and lets them know that there's a parking ban. We also uh, uh, go through the media outlets as well, uh, News 9, the radio stations, uh, and that type of stuff. So we do have them announce it as well through yep. the radio and that type of thing. So they have that media. And there's also uh, a service that they can sign up for and get a text, okay, if somebody goes into the city web page on the parking enforcement, they, it'll tell them the route to go, and you can actually have a text sent to your phone when the parking ban has been called. And uh, we call the parking ban, or we try to, by noontime of the day of the, uh, of the ban. So if today was going to be a snowstorm and we wanted to call a parking ban for overnight tonight, it would be around noontime that the, that notice would go out, and it would start at 11 o'clock tonight and would go through till 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. And, uh, you know, we, uh, during the winter storm when it's plowing, uh, it's no, no cars parked on city streets during that time. So obviously we can't plan when these storms are going to happen. There are going to be motors that are on the road because they have to be on the road. Uh, what kind of information or advice can you give them to give them, uh, say they were behind a plow truck? Biggest thing is to give them room, okay? Don't get right up behind a plow truck. Uh, if you can't see their mirrors, they can't see you. So stay far enough back, you know, four or five seconds back. And if they're slowing down and they're coming to a stop, give them some room. Stay back that room. Stay, see their mirrors because sometimes what they're doing is they're getting turned around to go back down the street again. So they're going to have to back up a little bit. And if you're too close, you're going you're gonna to have an accident they'll back into or, you know, they'll, they'll have to wait for you to move and then it slows everything down. So biggest thing is to give them some room. Uh, the next thing is if you see, if you're on coming to one, if you can get as far to the right as you can. The plows, uh, when they're down with a plow and a wing, it's 16 feet wide. And uh, they need some room to maneuver that. And obviously we have a wing operator. They can pick the wing up, but then it's not doing as good a job plowing the road. So if you can pull to the right as much as you feel comfortable, that would be one of the best things to do too. And, uh, and, and not pass them, you know what I mean? Give them a little bit of respect. They're slow, but what they're doing is they're cleaning off the road for you and it'll be much better, much safer for them behind the plow than it would be to get past them and go in front of them. Jim, what type of recommendations would you have uh, for people who live in the city uh, shoveling in the driveways, where to put that snow if they... Yeah, I know it's uh, interesting. A lot of people think we wait around the corner to them to clean their driveway so we can plow the snow back in the driveway, but that's not true. Uh, what, we, what we do is a good rule of thumb is if there's still snow in the street, we're going to be back by to plow. And, and again, we do our major cleanup after 11 o'clock at night, so bear with us a little bit. Uh, when you're plowing your driveway or shoveling your driveway, try to get as much of it on, the, on your lawn, the front lawn that you have, 
or on the bank in between the sidewalk and the road. Uh, don't throw it out in the street again because it's just going to get plowed back into you. And it also causes a safety hazard for another motorist driving down the street. If it freezes, it turns into a, you know, a real bad speed bump or a mogul and it could cause damage to that car or cause an accident for that car. So, you know, be respectful of others and, and, uh, and we try to clean up and get it done as quick as we can. And, you know, but there is some final cleanup that happens overnight. So you may end up with a small window at the end of your driveway. And, and again, just place that, you know, next to your driveway or on the front lawn if you can. And uh, don't push it into the sidewalk if you happen to have a sidewalk in front of your house. Uh, we're going to come through. We're going to try to open those sidewalks. And if you've tucked it in too tight and we can't get through it, then people aren't going to be able to walk through there either. And uh, we try to get as many of the sidewalks as we can. So, again, try to put it on between the sidewalk and the road. If there's room on your front lawn, that's where it should go. And, and uh, you know, if, if everybody could do that, it would make it a lot safer and easier for everyone to pass, too. Now, if someone, we talk about safety hazards. If a resident sees a safety hazard, what should they do? Uh, they should call the, the police department because the police department can enforce the, uh, the ordinances that are there. Um, and we will try to uh, get names and plates or numbers off uh, trucks that we can let people know that are doing, you know, if they're plowing across the street and you see it, the, the best thing to do is get a name and number off that plate. And Because and, and, what we'll do is if they let us know, we're going to end up talking to the police department and asking them to come up and help us and just knock on the door and say, hey, you know, you, you can't really be doing that because it's causing a safety hazard for everybody. So, Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, before we leave, is there anything else you want to tell our viewers? Yeah, in your uh, November water bill, we do have a... Uh, mail stuffer and it talks about snow removal operations and the, uh, the card on it goes through a lot of the things that we just talked about uh, stay off the roads if you can you know stay back if you can talks about not uh, plowing snow across the street and that type of stuff so be looking out for this in November and, and if you could take a look at it and it, it gives you some resources that you can look online as well to sign up for those notifications for the parking bans and so forth and it kind of goes over a lot of the things that we went through today and try to that way if it's uh, if everybody acts safely together and works together on it, we're going to get the roads cleared quicker and people will be out traveling a lot uh, safer as well. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. The Concord Police Department is asking the public for their assistance in identifying the persons involved with the alleged fraudulent use of credit cards. On September 11, 2014, a male subject reported to police that fraudulent charges had been posted to his Navy Federal Credit Union credit card. The victim was alerted by his bank that on September 10th, his credit card was used to make a purchase of $5,000 from Target in Hooksett, New Hampshire, and an attempted purchase of $6,500 at Target in Concord, New Hampshire. The attempted purchase at the Concord Target was made at approximately 9.30 p.m. and was declined by the bank. The victim reported that he still had possession of his credit card and he believes that his card information was illegally transferred to another card. The victim learned that the subject who used his credit card had attempted to purchase other gift cards at the Concord Target. Concord PD obtained video footage from both of the Concord and Hooksett Target stores. In the video, two black males, approximately 20 to 25 years old, can be seen attempting to make the fraudulent transactions. One of the males is described as being heavyset and wearing a red hoodie and black t-shirt and red shorts. He is wearing a black and blue high top sneakers. A second male can be seen wearing a white t-shirt and black pants that appear to be pushed up just below his knee. He is wearing white and red sneakers and is described as having a thin build and short black hair. Store officials have reportedly seen these two individuals in the past stating that they are always together and always operating a black Dodge Charger. It is believed that on September 10, 2014, that these two made thousands of dollars in gift card purchases at the Concord Target stores and throughout the state of New Hampshire. It is likely there are additional victims who have not yet been alerted by their banks or credit card companies. Police have reason to believe that at least one of the subjects seen in the video has displayed a fraudulent New York State identification in the past. Police have recovered video surveillance from the store security and is asking the public to assist them in identifying the individuals of interest depicted in the photographs. Anyone who has information relative to any criminal incident is asked to call the Concord Regional Crime Line at 603-226-3100 or submit your information online at the website of www.concordregionalcrimeline.com.
We're here at the New Hampshire Highway Safety meeting with uh, Peter Thompson and Steve Sargent. Gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, meeting with me today. Thank you. Uh, before we begin, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here? Well, uh, I've been with the Highway Safety Agency for 20 years now, going on to 21 years. And um, uh, what we do is really and truly the mission is to reduce deaths, injuries, and uh, uh, damaging resulting from motor vehicle crashes. So that's the overlooking uh, project that we're doing. Good. And Steve? Well, I'm actually a field rep for the agency. And as a responsibility for the for uh, the agency, and I've been here 18 years now, um, my, it's my job to go out and work with the local law enforcement, uh, municipalities, small communities, uh, and county sheriffs to help them look at some of the, the problem areas in their community that, so they can address traffic safety issues. And uh, I cover five northern counties, and so I get a chance to get out uh, quite frequently and, and travel across the state and meet with them. We're a small agency, really. We have six uh, employees uh, and uh, two field reps, Steve and John, mm -hmm. uh, and they cut the state in half. And Steve likes the northern part, and <laughs> John likes the, the John, lower part. John got stuck with the lower part, yeah. <laughs> uh, Peter, what does the New Hampshire uh, Highway Safety Agency do? Well, first of all, uh, it came into uh, existence in 1966 when Congress uh, uh, put together the Highway Safety uh, uh, Act of 1966, and uh, uh, what they did was then give it to the uh, the state, the governor, at that particular time. And uh, every state is a little bit different, mm -hmm. and uh, I think our state is is here again uh, first in the nation uh, because. What happens in New Hampshire, uh, it is the governor's highway safety agency. Mm -hmm. The governor uh, puts me into the position, whereas, let's take the, uh, uh, the state of Connecticut. Uh, my comp my uh, uh, person that has my uh, uh, job uh, is four levels down in the bureaucracy, uh, mm -hmm. whereas New Hampshire, I can go over and talk to the governor about a particular project or, or something like that. So I think New Hampshire has done a really good job in, in uh, utilizing mm -hmm. what the feds did for yeah. us. All of our funding comes from the federal government. We don't take anything out of the uh, general fund of mm -hmm. the state. Good. Steve, what do you think the most dangerous thing that drivers do on the road that you see in working with the agency? Well, in, in my travels around the state, the two biggest uh, violations that I actually witness are probably going to be uh, the texting mm -hmm. issue. And quite frequently, uh, there's been a huge uptick in red light violations mm -hmm. running. The numbers of, of crashes are probably very low, and that's a good part of it is due to the Department of Transportation having set delay times between the red mm -hmm. and the green lights uh, coinciding together. This morning on the way in, I witnessed somebody running a red light, and as soon as they were in the intersection, my side turned green. Uh, so they're trying to beat that yellow light, and, and that's that's one of those mm -hmm. are two of the biggest problems we have in the state. Speeding is always going to be an issue. Uh, drugs and alcohol are always going to be issues, mm -hmm. and those have not gone away. Uh, so, any upcoming projects that you have going on in the city of Concord? Well, I've been fortunate enough to work with the city of Concord for uh, ever since I've been with the agency. And uh, over the years, of course, administration changes, their, their needs and wants change. But I will say that in the, in the last few administrations have taken traffic safety as a very serious issue in the city of Concord. And uh, they have been very proactive. They have taken advantage of, not advantage, but they have participated in uh, some of the programs that we are able to offer and able to fund uh, through a grant process to the city of Concord. Uh, some of the ongoing projects that they've been doing for a number of years. I know of people in the city of Concord see the sign up on Loudoun Road. Mm -hmm. It talks about the uh, Loudoun Road enforcement. That was a project that was started back in 2001, mm -hmm. uh, initially with some funding from our, this agency. That's been an ongoing uh, project ever mm -hmm. since. And that's towards uh, speed related issues, uh, distracted driving. They really look for all those things when the officers are out there doing that patrol. The city's also been very heavily involved with uh, attacking the DWI problem. Yep. 
Uh, they've done single, you know, DWI patrols. They've also participated in a, uh, a project that's uh, uh, being ongoing uh, sobriety checkpoints in Merrimack County. Uh, there's been a group here in Southern Merrimack County that uh, uh, other agencies put together and they're able to coordinate in like a task force situation. And they've done very well with those uh, sobriety mm -hmm. checkpoints. One of the interesting things about the checkpoints is um, when they were first started being done some, some, some uh, five or six years ago, people were giving little cards about for comic cards. Even to this day, the comic cards that come back, 98% of them are very positive. People feel that doing a sobriety checkpoint is a very good way of addressing the possibility of, of finding uh, an individual driving uh, a motor vehicle under the influence of drugs or alcohol. So it's been a very successful program. Excellent. So you mentioned that the uh, funding comes from the federal government, but uh, what does that go towards? Well, there's several different uh, pots that come to the state. Uh, our basic uh, funding source is 402, and, and that's the basis for the agency, and that's a $1,700,000. Uh, then because of, of New Hampshire's uh, doing goodwill uh, in, the, in the Highway Safety Agency, we have uh, a 408, which is a traffic records uh, uh, improvement, and that's $500,000 that they gave to us. Uh, in 2010, we have motorcycle training programs, $100,000 for that. And then uh, the, the big one is the alcohol uh, problem, which is a uh, million dollars every year for, for because of mm -hmm. what we have done with the funds. And, uh, you know, I can't say enough for the law enforcement community, uh, local sheriffs, state police have done an outstanding job. And that has culminated the fact that uh, in uh, uh, 2000 and, um, uh, let me see, 2011, we had 90 fatalities, which is the lowest in 50 years. So, uh, as I said, I can't say enough good things for the law enforcement community. Uh, so what information would you like to get out to the public, or if the public needs to contact your law enforcement or you, how do you guys handle that? Well, my suggestion would be if they have some issues in, about traffic safety in their community, that first of all, they address that with the local police department. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're looking for more information about our agency, and how it works, and so forth, we definitely would be willing to take time to answer any of those questions for the general public. After all, it is their money mm -hmm. coming back to them from the federal government that they actually pay in their taxes. And they can do that by calling our office here and somebody will be willing to, to help them and or get back to them uh, when we can. And uh, the phone number for, uh, the general phone number is 271-2131 and that will put them in touch with our office. Peter, thank, thank you very much for meeting with me today. Thank you. All right, Steve, thank you very much. Thank you, you're welcome. We all want to support our wounded warriors, and on a recent trip to Concord High School, I was very fortunate to speak to Matt Cashman and Steve Mello to talk about a unique project called Operation Hat Trick. We're here again with Matt Cashman. Matt, thanks for joining us again. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I hear a lot of hype going on with this uh, Operation Hat Trick. Can you kind of explain a little bit what it's all sure, about? Sure, sure, we can. Um, it's funny, it's a nice little story. Steve Mello, our athletic director, and I, we, we were reading a book in the fall um, based on some Navy SEALs and some uh, wounded warriors and we got to talking and um, really Steve has a good good story to tell on this we uh, we we shared a lot of aspects of the book and we we said you know this might be a cool idea to bring it to the high school level so with that I guess I'll ask Steve to explain a little bit about what what Steve came up with uh, Operation Hattrick was uh, started at the University of New Hampshire it's, it's a charity to benefit wounded warriors and to help uh, to help veterans um, University of New Hampshire sponsored it, started it, and it's named after, uh, it's dedicated to Nate Hardy, who was a Navy SEAL, lost his life, who also, his dad is a professor at UNH and also happens to be a friend of mine. So that's how I learned about it. And uh, basically, if you went to any number, I think about 200 colleges, you can buy a hat online that has University of Connecticut. I have one that says University of New Hampshire. I believe you bought I one at the University Maine. of Maine, much That's as right. I don't like the Black Bears. I'm glad you <laughs> supported the charity. Uh, so just got to thinking that maybe we could do this on the high school level. Uh, you and I had a conversation about that. Uh, I brought it to my colleagues at the New Hampshire Athletic Directors Association. Uh, we signed up 63 schools in New, in New Hampshire. 
Uh, we've raised to this point about seventy thousand uh, dollars, the biggest donation ever made to Operation Hattrick. OHT New Hampshire Initiative Awareness Week, it's a bit of a mouthful, is next week, uh, week of the 12th through the 16th. So all, all throughout New Hampshire, all participating schools, baseball and softball teams specifically, will be wearing uh, OHT hats, this nice one here, camo hat. This one has the Crimson Tide logo mm -hmm. on it. Uh, for instance, Laconia Sachems will have their logo mm -hmm. on it. So each individual school has their own logo on the hat. Uh, and the way the money was raised, it's really all about the students getting involved. I mean, our our students got involved, went out and pre-sold over 400 of these hats just from Concord, mm -hmm. and other schools did a similar thing. Uh, students right now are working with me to put on some ceremonies next week. We got planned for the 14th and the 16th. Uh, we got the band coming out. We got some veterans throwing out the first pitch, and we just want to be respectful of veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to raising money, which is one of our main objectives, we also want to raise awareness, especially with the high school community. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we get. Time goes by as you get older. I mean, some of these kids nowadays, if they're a freshman, they don't even know what the uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom was. You know, it's like World War II to them. It's a, it's a, it's a long time ago. Uh, but as we all know, people that are affected by this, they come home and things aren't necessarily the way they were when they left. So in addition to raising money, we want to raise awareness. Uh, it's similar to if you watch NFL games and uh, guys wear like pink gloves mm -hmm. to raise awareness for breast cancer. So you're going to see a lot of camo hats around the state of New Hampshire next week. Raise awareness and consciousness and people to honor and respect mm -hmm. uh, our veterans. And that's uh, really what it's all about. So what else can, I know you've gone out and you sold this in the community. Is there anything else the public can do to uh, either further purchase hats or any other donations? How would they go about uh, doing that? Well, you know, it's funny. When we brought this idea to Dot Sheehan at UNH, she, she definitely had her ears wide open but she said you know this was going to be a lot of work mm -hmm. and um and i gotta say you know steve has really taken the ball we've he's met with all the athletic directors throughout and we didn't know at first it, it, how contagious the idea was um, but we needed to, before i think a lot of hats were purchased we needed to make sure the idea was going to take and like seventy thousand dollars shows throughout the state that there is a, a keen awareness mm -hmm. to it, and we just got these hats today, and some people have said, you know, are there any extras? How mm -hmm. can we buy? So this could be the start of, of what good things are to come. Mm -hmm. You know, there could be more to right. sell down the road. We're gonna, once we get through this initiative, we're going to talk about what the next thing mm -hmm. is, and we're not exactly sure what that is, but we're going to talk about doing another initiative. Uh, but right now, there's a couple of things people can do. They can go to the Operation Hat Trick website. Right. If, for instance, if you're unfortunate enough to be a University of Maine alumni <laughs> like my friend here, or you went to a real university like the University of New Hampshire, uh, you can purchase a hat and of course the proceeds go uh, to the Operation Hat Trick on Warrior Fund. Uh, you can make a donation online. Uh, certainly I'd like to see as many people come out next week on the 14th and 16th at Memorial Field at 4 o'clock to support uh, our activities and certainly to support and recognize our veterans. Uh, we are going to be taking names of people that are interested in purchasing one of these fine, fine hats. And if we, if we get enough to make another order, we will do that. So I assume I can sign mm -hmm. you up as soon as we leave here today. Absolutely. Uh, so we're going to do that, and we're going to take a list, make a list. And if we have enough, then we'll, we'll make a secondary order. And, you know, again, just to highlight, it's not just happening here in Concord. It's happening all next week. Right. So okay. every baseball yep. game and softball game next week um, yep. representative so, teams will have yeah, their so in the viewing audience Merrimack Valley is involved, Bow is involved, okay. Brady's so, involved mm -hmm. so virtually all of the area, Belmont, right. all the area mm -hmm. schools uh, Laconia, uh, Army Cole Brown, it, all the, really Hopkinton uh, so whatever community you're from uh, contact your athletic director and tell them you have an interest in you know, supporting Operation Hattrick and the New Hampshire High School Initiative mm -hmm.